Right, we're here again for the next video. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be talking about breath holds and touching on seizures today, aren't we? And uh, yeah. Yes, we are. And I just wanted to say before I get the video going, I've made a Facebook group for people in the UK, but it's open to anyone. Anyone's welcome. Um, and I'll put the link in the description below. And uh, anyone come over and if you want to talk or whatever, we're there. And uh, I'll leave the links to the other groups as well, like the American one and the soft groups. I just thought I'd get that out of the way first. And then anyone watching who doesn't want to watch the whole video can just go and talk to people straight away. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're talking about breath holds and some seizures today and our experience with them and how we've dealt with them um i've had a lot of a lot of experience with the breath hold side of things um and you've had a bit more experience seizure side of things haven't you yep definitely on the seizures and i think our breath holds here at least graces and our experience are a little bit different than yours so it, yeah. it'll be interesting to talk about both and how you know there's different variations with that i'm not sure if i'm right in saying but i think i think apneas even though apne apnea it means like the stopping of the breathing i think yeah. apnea is slightly different to breath holding isn't it they're are they not yeah. two different things i think so and i'll explain grace breath holds at least and what i think versus like an apnea type episode Grace would do what we would call here, at least, is she would clamp down when she was younger. Um, okay. When she was crying. Uh, and that's when we would have that type of episode happen. So, what do you mean? Like, she would just. So, she would. Up. Yeah, she would tense up. She would. Um, she had this response to pain. It, it, and she's got a couple different things going on. So, you know, you've got this clamping down where she would be in some type of pain or super irritation and she would cry and she's like screaming, but she's screaming. And at the same time that she's like so upset and anger, she's holding her breath at that same time. Would she, would she, I was just thinking, would she go noticeably blue or gray or? No. So, so she would turn red like she's just angry okay <laughs> she's just angry but but still you're like okay you're so angry can you please take a breath like she would do yeah. it until she's you know ex exhausted well until she pretty much ran out of gas screaming and then she's like <gasps> okay okay yeah. let me scream some more um but I, think, I was gonna say i think darcy had similar like when she had her injections and stuff they were like is she going to breathe? Because she just yeah cry and then just stay like that for ages, like so angry and yeah. I don't know what it is. Like she just you know when she's in pain or comfortable, like gas or like you said, she'd get a shot. Uh, yeah. UTI pain. That was when we would see it when she would have urination and it was painful. So we had that, but her apnea spells is when she would turn. Um, like that dusky gray, blue color, very, very, very pale. Yeah. Is that the color that Darcy would turn when she has her breath holding? No, Darcy was quite different. I mean, Darcy, like I say, she'd have the the same anger thing where she'd just, uh, and, you know, we'd be like, wow, is she going to breathe? And she'd, she'd breathe and start crying. But the breath holding was very, very sort of different. It was... Um, we found out in the end it was re reflex anoxic seizures, which aren't seizures, um, but caused like by you know pain or a shock um, of the vagal vagal. It's a heightened response to pain. We think in the wow. you know like um, what's it called the vagal nerve. I know there's two. There's the vag mm -hmm. vagus and vagal. But um, yeah, so it would get basically just overloaded and it, it 
shut down her breathing. And so she'd be sitting there. Um, usually, like, we think a gastric pain mm-hmm. or possibly reef flux or UTI they seem to be related a lot to UTIs with Darcy um but I know in normal I've used that a few times in the video normal children um they 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 can be linked to iron deficiencies as well but I think our children are a lot more complex um so it could be a lot of different things with ours couldn't it but um yeah, we think it's a heightened response to some sort of pain or something, and um, she would just be sitting there. <clears throat> Nothing really would happen. She'd just she'd sit there, and then suddenly she'd go, and it'd either be one of the other children or me or Beck would be like, you know, they'd, they'd say, Mum or Dad, Darcy, stop breathing, or we'd be like, God, she stopped, you know, she, she stopped. <laughs> what right, she right. Um, and uh, she, you, could, you could always tell because she'd be, she'd look really sort of, and she'd just go grey, like mm-hmm. completely grey. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I asked about the colour because there's there's two different types of um, breath hold spells. There's there's one that's triggered by um, them getting really angry, and right. they, they go blue. And right. uh, this one's the grey one where. <clears throat> it's it's involuntary. They they can't do anything about it. It's uh, it's just an overload, really. Or, and uh, yep. yeah, she would. Uh, I don't know. She'd just do that, and and we'd be very sort of like it was very scary, very traumatic. The the first time it happened, I, I was sitting watching telly with her, and I was sitting there. You know, I had her in my arms, just relaxing, watching telly, and then I was just like, she stopped breathing. Nothing, no cue, no nothing. Just she stopped breathing, and uh, I thought that was it. I thought she died. I thought, you know, this is yeah. it. Um, and I was really, really panicking, and we called the ambulance and everything, and uh, they they checked her. You know, because by the time they got here, she'd started breathing again. Right. Right. Um, because she would, she'd hold, she'd breath hold to the point where she passes out. Um, sorry, I'm just checking my phone, it went a bit dim. Um, she'd lose consciousness, and then a minute or two later, she would take a breath, start mm-hmm. breathing again. Wow. And she did seem really sort of spaced out, really sort of not with it. Um, and yeah, they, the, the, um, but when we called the ambulance and that, they'd done like, you know, checked her pulse, checked her everything. And they said it was normal, but it, it was like she'd, I think it spiked or something on their machine. They said it was like she was responding to a pain. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were like, oh, okay, um, you know, still trying to get, get our sanity back because <laughs> I was like completely wow. just, you know. Very uh, experiences. I think it made it worse because a doctor we'd spoken to before said, oh, sometimes these babies just die, you know. That's what he'd said. And it's like, wow. So there's me sat there and I was like, oh, this is it. You know, it's just happened. And it's really scary. But, um, yeah, we, we kind of learned in time. It, got, it became very frequent. Some days it would be several times a day. And... Uh, was that a sign that she was maybe ill or had like a UTI or or any oh, yeah. other signs? Yeah, in in I mean, it took us a long time to kind of figure out what's going on because, to be honest, the doctors weren't very helpful with identifying it. Um, you tell them on the phone or something, they kind of just mm-hmm. be like, "Oh yeah, oh that's not nice" or something like that. They wouldn't actually say anything. And then it happened at one of our appointments at Great Ormond Street. And that's where one of the doctors actually said, this is what it is. Um, so we're like, OK, um, we already suspected it anyway, because we've been doing our own research. So we're mm-hmm. like, no, we think it's this, because this seems to fit that. And uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, we, we kind of just learn as we went along what how to deal with it and that. And 
Um, once we know it as a reflex um, anoxic seizure, we kind of knew what to do and what to look out for and that, that they say not to intervene, like you're not meant to. Um, so if, if anyone's watching this video and you know that your child is having these um, breath holds spells um, and you know it's definitely that, you need to know what you're dealing with first, then right. you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to intervene. You shouldn't have to intervene. You should obviously keep an eye on the time to know whether to intervene or not. But with us and these breath hold spells, if we intervened like we had a few times in the early mm -hmm. early times, or that time at the hospital at Great Ormond Street when the doctors intervened, it actually lengthened it and made it worse. Um, so on quite a few occasions as well, she'd been fed and she would reflux really badly because she'd just lose consciousness and suddenly it just all start pouring out of her mouth. Wow. So what we what we seen what we learned was to, you know, it happens, try and hold her, keep her safe, you know, obviously. If she's on a settee or something or we're near a bed, we'd lay her down kind of in the recovery position, you know, so she's on her side. And, and would you be elevated? Um, not really. We would try and elevate her head a bit, and that for the mm. reflux, mm -hmm. for reflux reason, she'd always be slightly elevated at one end. Um, but we would go straight. The first thing we'd do is go straight to the suction machine and clear her throat, uh, clear anything that's in the way, um, because when she came back round, she'd always take a big breath, and we really you know, would worry about her um, just breathing in food, like milk oh. or saliva or anything, because obviously that's a big cause of chest infections, which is another issue with tries me 13 children, isn't it? Right. Um, yep. So, yeah, you, you're not meant to do CPR or blow into their mouths. Um, and obviously make sure you know what you're dealing with. But obviously our babies are a bit more complex than most. So that's why I put the emphasis on people need to know what they're dealing with before. Right. Try to do anything because, you know, the, the baby might need intervention. The baby might need yes. air and stuff. I think anyway, like, well, yeah, experiences. I, I think you're absolutely right though, because you know, if you know that she, didn't have any other type of apnea type issues, then, you know, you can't relate that what you would do in an apnea type issue is the same what you would need to do for this per particular situation. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just think, I, I think it's very easy with a child that's born with no issues, really, who suffers uh -huh. breath hold spells or something. It's very easy to put an umbrella sort of way to deal with them exactly instruction thing out there but with our children they're very different and i think it's it takes a lot more caution um yeah. in in dealing with things you need to really sort of look at the symptoms look at what's happening and uh try and do the best you, can. you have to do a, a process of elimination you know yeah. you, you you know you start with some of the more common items okay so that is it possibly, you know, like you said, upper airway, is it obstructive type apnea, or maybe it's lower, uh, you know, down below, or yeah. if it's maybe none of that at all, and it's something else, you know, neurological, or is it yeah, a reaction, like you said, to nerve and reflux? I mean, there's, there's so many variations of our children. I do think as well, like it's really scary for us because we've got this constant thought in our heads that our children are just going to not be yep. here one day. Yeah. Um, and I think in those scenarios, it's really, really important to try and put that aside and remain calm because yep. like one thing that I, dealing with Darcy's taught me is that there's there's quite a bit of time between the event taking place mm -hmm. and the point where it's it's really serious and because how i first reacted or would react is uh you go straight to it's really serious 
right. and you kind of panic and just like, oh, and I think that that's the biggest sort of bit of advice I could give to people is try and stay calm and actually look at what's happening and try and figure it out. You know, take their heart rate, check their check what you can, the other vital signs and make sure exactly. things are, you know, going along. Like, is the heart rate high or low or or there some some cases they might they might have a um complete stop of everything i don't know what that i think one of the symptoms of a reflex anapsic seizure is a slowed heart rate Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's like i said it's it's (laughs) you you really need people just need to try and stay calm and it's a really hard thing to do and that's so so hard I, I've learned, you know, with, with Grace, if she's having, you know, certain moments, same thing, we have, you know, our suction machine nearby, but a yeah. lot of times for us, it's just getting her into a safe position that we know yeah. is, is going to helpful, which is for her, it's, her bed is elevated anyways. We have one end of the crib always yeah, up, so far, see, it says it's a bit- you know, for reflux And uh, so for her, you know, ours is making sure she's in a good position, which is we'll usually put her on her side. We'll roll her to her side if something's happening and then just kind of open up her mouth or airway. So if there is something, then at least I know it's going to pour out, you know, on her side and, you know, just kind of monitor her her colors. But was was this with her breath holding? Well, the interesting thing about her when she used to have her type of like breath holding spell spells is is really because she had obstructive apnea. So she had, so that's the reason why she needs her trach. And for us, our situations, we actually haven't had one since she's had her trach. Ever since we, we got her tracheostomy, that has since stopped. So she had, when she was in the NICU, we had upper airway bedside scopes and they would look, you know, here in this area and her, her upper trachea and we yeah. never had any issue. But what it was is it, the issues of her apnea was further down her trachea, which is right by um, the two bronchi that go into her lungs. So that's where she had the tracheal bronchial uh malaysia and so actually one second i'm just going to close this because i've got a lot oh yeah no a screen glare that's better <laughs> i can see i can see you better now sorry no i didn't mean to interrupt <laughs> no no problem so it wasn't until we had a bronchoscopy done which was done sedated that they discovered that because basically they had to go way further down with the camera to really see the opening and they would see okay. like her airway collapsing on it when she would, you know, breathe, it, it wouldn't open up properly. Um, is, and that so what, this, is that in this part? Lower. So right, right into the entry of your lungs. So right where the trachea goes down and then you get the bron- two bronchi, which then goes so, to your lungs. So where that goes in, does that go in and down then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So her trach. Oh, I, th- I thought yep. it just sat there. I didn't know. If that- yep. So, yep. It goes right into the neck, right in here, below the voice box. That's the reason why you can't hear, because when you talk and we're speaking, the air goes into our mouth and then hits the voice box. So, so oh, there's okay. a hole there. And then it basically has like a, a tube. And so when she was younger in the NICU, she, we had, you know, after heart surgery, they extubated her. She would be on like CPAP and then they had her on high flow oxygen. And we made it all the way down to where she was on very low oxygen, no assistance. But what was happening is she'd get tired. So she'd be up during the day using all her energy. And then she'd be like, okay. I'm really tired because she, her airway wasn't opening as, as much as that needed to. And so she would turn this gray dusky color. She'd be like, 
upset and she'd get so upset because she's like, I'm trying to get enough air in. And then she'd like turn gray and just desaturate, you know, really low and have these episodes. And you could see the color, you know, that dusky gray color just, yeah, it's, it was scary. That's another thing, actually. A lot of the children seem to suffer from DSATs, don't they? they, they yep. I've yep. that a lot. So her saturations would go from, you know, 98, 99 to 60, 50, 40. I mean, it got as low as I think we saw it as like 10 or 15. And that's when they would initiate what they would call the, the bagging, you know, where they would take the Ambu bag you know, that has oxygen and place it over and, you know, they're manually basically giving that's her the, That's the uh, squeezy one, isn't it? Yeah. The, yep. Right. Yep. One second. I think I have one to demonstrate. I have one nearby too, in case we need it. <laughs> Let me just go to Darcy's. Uh... It's not something we've had to sort of use... That's this, isn't it? Yep, that is it. That's the amber for anyone, out, for anyone out there watching, when you hear the term bagging, they're on about this. Yep. Um, yep. So they would they would utilize that. And then once we had her bronchoscopy done, that's when we learned that, you know, basically um, on her towards her right lung, the pathway was a lot narrow than a normal person and then the collapsing of like that trachea. So they had offered us a different type of surgery to kind of open and put like a, a stable piece in her trachea area uh, yeah. to keep it open. And, but the thing is, is that she had heart surgery already and her heart surgeon was like, her heart is really stable right now we don't want to mess with it. And the fact that we could be working in that same area that's very close to the heart, we could actually hurt her. And then that would mean opening her up again. And we, we were like, no, at that no. point. So we opted well, for- Her body's been through so much. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we already gave her that opportunity. And so that's when we got the, the trach. Um, and so, she has the ventilator, which provides, you know, the extra pressure that she just needs to kind of keep her airway open. And yeah. so she, she breathes on her own. I know that's always a topic from old literature, medical literature, which is, you know, they, kids have central apnea and they don't breathe on their own, um, which I'm sure there are cases of, but for her, she takes her own breaths. She does everything on her own. It's just she didn't have enough strength to, you know, get that air pressure um, down below. Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of children with trisomy 13 connected to machines and then some mm -hmm. just haven't got anything here, just the, just a little it's a, thing. Yeah, <clears throat> so it's a, usually like a HME, which provides, it um, helps to have humidified air. So, you know, when we breathe through our nose and we breathe through our mouth, it's warm air and those little pieces help to keep the airway from getting dry. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, we've been working on sprinting her, which is getting her off the vent and getting her lungs stronger. So she has uses her own pressure, but um, yeah. So we had tons of those episodes practically daily the only time we never had them is when she was resting or sleeping like she was she was fine you know because she wasn't using all her energy to try to try to breathe or move around or anything yeah. like that um but yeah it, it was daily for let's see august like three months three months of that so how did they how did you eventually go from that the the sort of uh, breathing spells happening to identifying what was causing it. How how did they get from one to the other? Did they straight away say, "Oh, we need to check down there," or was that something you had to ask for? 
No, I mean, luckily, I mean, you know, we did ask like, well, what's next? What do we have to look for when it was happening? We were actually debating between whether it was an airway issue or if it was a withdrawal issue because we, sure. you know, she was on all those medications and drugs from her heart surgery and she was on some heavy stuff. Yeah, so yeah. they, they already know they're like, well, she's going to have some withdrawals. So we went through like a whole medication regimen to get her body not used to that. So she wasn't and, passing out, was she? Like, was no, she, thankfully she never really like fully passed out. She, she would, um, go limp, but not a fully pass out because by that time the nurses usually came and they were already bagging her. They were already initiating extra yeah. breaths for her. So, um, but once we got rid of all the medication, that was really the sign when we were on super low doses, they yeah. were like, no, we, we need to check further and do another whole like evaluation. And after that, if they hadn't seen anything there, then they were going to ask us to do an MRI because they wanted to then check her actual brain and see yeah. if we did anything. Yeah. So that was eventually going to be the plan, but then we found a problem. So that, that's a bit like us, actually. We, um, <clears throat> in trying to fully diagnose what it was, um, mainly ourselves, we, we um, started cutting out medicines and things because mm -hmm. we were like, could this be causing this? Could this be causing gastric pain and that? Um, she was on ranitidine for reflux, I think. <clears throat> um, but I mentioned to you before the ranitidine got recalled anyway because it's carcinogenic right. or something. Um, um, wait, have I got my medicines mixed up? It's ranitidine, isn't it? What's the one that Grace is on as well that we said? Oh, lactulose. Oh, yeah, yeah. Darcy had lactulose as well. Um, what else has she got? So we managed to cut both of them out anyway, completely. Um, she has a bit of um, nitrofurotoin to help people with UTIs, but that's very minimal. Um, and she has her, her eye drops for glycoma. Mm -hmm. um, well, all the earlier stuff we, we totally cut out. She's only on two medicines at the moment now. Um, and we give her extra extra minerals and vitamins um, through like special, you know, like the special bottles, multi yeah. vitamins for children and stuff. Yeah, we give her extra ones of them. Um, but yeah, we really had to sort of take out all the stuff that we could take out to try and narrow down what was going on. Um, which is also how we figured out that with her milk, uh, she was having very bad sort of gastric problems yeah. because of her milk. Um, and we, it was driving us mad actually, um, because obviously we were relating these pains to the breath holds. Right. And we we're like, why is she getting so uncomfortable in her tummy and stuff? And someone, someone actually said to us just, just um, randomly in a conversation or if you had a check for um like lactose intolerance and we're like no you know and she was like oh check her get a get her checked for it and you know the sugars and stuff and we right. we were like looked up the symptoms and that we we're like actually this is very similar and we changed the milk to a lactose free one for like a week yeah. or so <clears throat> she seemed better then we went back to her old milk and it started again. We're like, okay, <laughs> it started, you know, this is definitely something in the milk. So we rung up um, the, I can't remember what they're called, what their titles are, the one that deals with her feeding and stuff. Um, and they got us a special milk. Not like sure a nutritionist? Let me see if I've got one. I normally have a spare in a bag. So she's on this. Pedia. Oh, okay. Pedia, sure. Um, and I think they were saying that this there's a certain sugar. So she's not lactose intolerant, but there's a certain sugar in the milk that she seems to be having a problem with. And this is special 
you know, and she seems to be fine on it. And it's taken away a lot of her stuff. And then we had to get on top of reflux as well, because that was right. another thing that we thought was triggering the breath hold. Right. Um, and by doing that, we 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 and so um, so we medicines and we just came up with our own better routine of feeding her where we could break down you know we're like right she needs this total amount during the day we need to break uh -huh. it into smaller amounts so she's not not experiencing reflux and it's worked it's worked we've got sort of a regimen of alarms going off during the day you know when she needs feeding when she needs water um and we're very you know able to watch for the signs of reflux now so we know to we we take some out if there's any signs straight away we take like 20 30 mil out did she ever have hiccups like a lot of hiccups yeah actually yeah um not so much now she mm -hmm. does have them on and off but mm -hmm. not not very often but before she used to get hiccups all the time like yeah quite um especially when rebecca was pregnant as well Mm -hmm. She was non-stop hiccuping in, in, um, whilst Beck was carrying her. Um, but yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I've never never really thought about that much. So I'm guessing that that could be connected to reflux as well, could it? Yeah, I, we talked to our GI about it because when, very interesting enough, when I was uh, carrying Grace, she had hiccups almost every day. And actually that, I used... I use that as my way of knowing if she was okay, you know, you're, you're going through this really scary pregnancy and yeah. the one peace of mind I had was, okay, if I could feel her and she was hiccuping or you know, moving around, then things were good. Um, but we actually ended up talking to GI because Grace was having a lot of, you know, reflux. And one of the things he had mentioned to us was, you know, constant hiccups was, a sign of, of reflux, a very, a different, you know, it wasn't obviously where she's at the point of vomiting, you know, yeah. but it, it was definitely a, a sign. And I was like, that's very interesting, you know, to know that she's had that since she was younger, you yeah, know, all the way until. Yeah, well. Darcy was the same. Mm -hmm. and like I say, when, when Rebecca was pregnant, I, I, I was shocked by the amount of times that Darcy had hiccups because mm -hmm. um, I hadn't noticed it with any of the other children you know right. um, but I think I think we related that to a cleft issue okay um, something to do with the swallowing I think they're taking a lot of air as well don't they or mm -hmm. when they try and swallow I'm not sure I'm not sure but yeah but um so there you go anyone watching if you're trying yep. to diagnose breath holds and that you might be having reflux issues as well and um i'm not personally i'm not convinced that the reflux was causing the issue but breath holds were definitely being triggered by something um gi you know um it's so fascinating so it's, 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 you've got you know a, a breath hold type spell like you said it could be you know gi and then you got Grace yeah. on the other end, where, which is, you know, definitely airway issue, you know. Well, with Darcy, we narrowed it down to it's definitely the things we got under control were her wind. So her gas, as uh, you would say over there. Um, not that we don't say gas, but we say wind a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, her, her wind... Um, so we got under control her wind, her reflux, yep. and things like constipation. And, and, you know, before this lockdown, so back in February, March time, the breath hold spells just stopped. And we haven't had them since. Um, so I don't know. what it, it seems like it was likely one of those things causing the issue. Um for wind, actually, for wind and that, we used to, or for, you know, if she's constipated and having trouble, it caused her a lot of grief. Mm -hmm. And um, what Rebecca would do a lot is get a little cotton bud, um, mm -hmm. 
what do you got? You guys call them Q-tips, don't you? Q-tips. Yeah, Q-tips, yeah. cat clubs. <laughs> yeah. She get a little cotton bud just round her bum, <laughs> and it would um, encourage her to poo. She would, yeah. she would poo or or let off a lot of wind. Because um, for some reason she'd get, I don't know, she'd clearly need a poo or something. Yeah. But it was almost like she was tensing up rather than pushing out. And do you know what I mean? It, it's just sometimes she just needed that bit of stimulation to sort of release everything, so to right, speak. Right. Um, which helped her a lot. I think it's something um, Beck picked up off of her mum. So some old family secret, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it definitely, definitely works. Yeah, guessy um, babies are not fun. They they are very cranky. They are like mm, not having it. It's not no yeah. great same way. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I mean, the other thing I noticed as well, actually, with breath holds and stuff. Um, before I forget, is I think some of them are commonly quite often mistaken with seizures, and that's why I wanted to touch on the seizures. Just mm-hmm. in this, um, because that was always a big question: Is she having a seizure? Right. Is she had breath hold. Right. Um, and even when, even when doctors had seen it, like I said, and said that she was having a breath hold, you'd still get doctors questioning whether she's having a seizure. And it's right. like she's not right. having a seizure. <laughs> um, I mean, you've experienced, we've experienced seizures a couple of times. Um, but with Darcy, it's only been through illness. Um, right. So the first time was when she had sepsis and she was in hospital and she was really ill. And it wasn't actually the sepsis. It was the, they were giving her extra fluids and stuff. Mm-hmm. And what they were doing was, they actually messed up. The hospital caused seizures, I think. Um she was having her salts were all out of whack and she was it, she was having flushes with saline mm-hmm. and it was causing a further problem and she started having seizures interesting she was, all, she was all puffy and you know it was it was really bad um they they you know, discovered the what was happening, told them to stop flushing the tube and that with saline. They were like, no, don't do that. Wow. Just water. And it all balanced out again soon and she stopped um, having seizures. But our experience with them there, the, oh yeah, the second time was when we, we think it was, um, it was a spe- suspected ear infection mm-hmm. um, that got quite bad. She was very, there was a lot of... Um, it was like phlegm, but... A lot of drainage. Whiter and a bit creamier, do you know what I mean? A bit more yeah. like it was coming from up here rather than the throat. Right. Um, I don't know where it exactly comes from, but you know what I mean? A sinusy right. um, sort of discharge. And, uh, yeah, we that was the that was the second time. Because it's quite hard to diagnose something with her because she doesn't show the usual symptoms of you know she won't sit there and go oh my ear hurts or right plus she's got an ear missing so you know we can't always if it is a if it is a problem with the ear that's missing we wouldn't actually know because there's no opening yeah but but everything inside is there so Got it. it's tricky isn't it um but yeah so our experience with seizures, the first time when it was a problem in the hospital was um, she would just suddenly sort of tense up, mm-hmm. go quite long. I don't know how to explain it, just sort of... Uh, and, um, like she'd stiffen. Her muscles yeah. would stiffen. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's quite a quite scary experience. The second time is different, though. The one... the like I say, the suspected ear infection one, because um, she needed antibiotics for that, and that actually mm-hmm. sorted everything out. But um, that was different because she kind of would 
laugh. She laughed before one happened, and uh, was it, it was just it wasn't so it wasn't the same as the hospital ones. It wasn't so sudden. It was more of a she was a bit more dreamy about it, I guess. You know, before they happened, right? Right. She Almost like and, she was she was kind of absent, just kind of yeah. The second ones, though, when were she sort of twitched like that, mm -hmm. whereas the first ones in the hospital were, like I said, stiff, sort of mm -hmm. sudden stiffness. Um, so they were quite different themselves. They were different types of seizures, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't think we could. I don't know. I mean, you've you've experienced yeah. more of the seizures, I think, that a lot of other parents would have with trisomy 13 babies. What sort of things did you notice straight away how did they come about is there any signs of them coming as well or? so we have attributed that grace's seizures that she had like two types of triggers um when she we kind of discovered them around when she was about four months and the first time i noticed it and and i would say to any parent that's out there if you think you're child is having a seizure and you've seen something you know come up once or twice if you can I know it sounds really scary and just like you're not taking care of your child but if you can record it because a lot of the times I've seen you know, you know neuro doctors it, you know you're describing something to them but because they can't see it then you know they don't um can't say yes that's what it is for sure and then if they don't have that information you know they may not want to go do testing until they they have that or they've seen it so the first time we noticed as she was having what we call a focal seizure i noticed mm -hmm. her eyes would do this fast rapid twi twitching when she was awake and then her tongue it would stick out like this and you can see it vibrating, very fluttering, very fast. Definitely That's faster. Strange. Yeah, definitely faster than what you and I could do, you know, normally if we were saying, okay, let me flutter my tongue. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it was very rare. It happened maybe once a month until we finally were able to capture it on video. I finally saw it, it was happening. And, and what's interesting is, I know a lot of times there's seizures that trigger where, you know, high elevated heart rates, possibly desaturations of kids, but she always held her vitals, which always, that's, that's why we're like, is this really seizure activity? Um, and it really led, once we had the video, we showed neuro, then they were able to let us get a EEG and actually, you know, do it for 24 hours to see if she was having seizures. Yeah. Then they were able to tell us and diagnosis and yes, those seizures actually ended up kind of going away. We um, ended up on Keppra and um, it, it seemed like things were managed, but as she got older and she started having more UTIs, then her seizures started triggering based on illness. It actually became a sign for us to know that she was getting ill um, and she would do the same thing like Darcy. She would have these tonic type clonic seizures where she would stiffen up and you could see her hands. So they would go like this and then they would turn mm. in like this and, and like clubbing and her feet would do the same thing. Her feet would turn inward and you can just see the muscles just stiffening and she would, you know. Was Darcy went. I was going to say when she breath holds, Darcy mm -hmm. would, her, when she passes out, uh, no, just before she passes out, she'd kind of tense up and she'd slowly sort of stretch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then just pass out. Wow. So I, I was just going to ask though, is when that happened, would there be a color change in her? No. And here again, you know, her vitals would remain the same. I was always looking for elevated heart rates or color to change. No, she wouldn't. What would happen is they would last no longer than about 30 seconds. I think her longest seizure she's ever had only happened once was about three minutes. Terrifying. But she would come out of it and she would just start crying. Like 
I don't know if it was painful for her, you know, and she's realizing yeah. she can't move. I mean, she would just cry so bad. It was just awful to see. And then eventually she would, she'd calm down and, you know, she would get a little tired and sometimes go to sleep. But most of the time then she acted like she was fine. So, yeah. it, it, you know, we'd have, the thing was, is we were on a couple different medications to help her seizures. And we would never know if the seizure was just caused on its own or if it was because she had a UTI. It would always be after UTI, oh, pain related. If she had shots, like her immunizations, yeah. the next day she would have a seizure and then it would go away she wouldn't have any more. So we were always in this pattern where it was like illness, immunization, illness, something going on where we never had a time of just nothing happening to where we could tell if she was just having seizures normally without any type of pain or illness relation. Yeah. Finally, we got to the point where we, she was still having seizures, no illness, no shots, no, no pain. Um, so then we eventually had to work on what was the right combination of medicine to keep them away. And thankfully we have ha not had any type of seizure activity since um, late June. So we've been oh, seizure free. Really? Yeah. We've been seizure free for quite some time and I'm just hoping it stays that way. Sorry, you were um, um, slowing down a little. <laughs> It started to freeze a little. Is that is that with medication? Who me? Okay. Am I freezing up? No, it was me. I think I was getting a some kind of interruption. Um, I was just saying though, does it have they stopped while she's on medication, or have you stopped medication? We have her on seizure medication. We have her on two. We have her on Keppra, and we have her on on fee. Um, and the, that that combination seems to help so my hope is is that at some point as she's getting older we can start to try to wean i think we can wean the kepper because it seems like the onfi has helped more wean yeah. that one and then still see if if we have any seizure activity so yeah because these are they're very serious drugs aren't they that these these uh, seizure medications they're very strong yeah, she's on a very, very low dose of Onfi, like the very minimal dose that you can actually, we're not even at the minimum dose. I asked her if we could go lower and she said, yes, and it's, and it's helping. So I'm hoping that at some point, like Kepra is very wide, widely used, a lot, very common and typically will help. I think most people with seizures, but there are some side effects um, to that where you can have like a, rage type reaction to yeah. so I've actually met some people where they've had that and, and, and they can't use it so they're on different other seizure, seizure meds I think Topamax is another one we were okay. using Lamictal for a while and then but we had to up the Lamictal but it was actually causing her more it was causing her to have myclonic jerks where every once in a while she would have these like little startles Cause she wasn't yeah. having infantile spasms. It was just these myclonic jerks. Like, like she would go like that. And that's the side effect of the Lamictal. At least our neuro told, told us that the higher dose of that could cause that. And so she's like, Oh, now we got to come off of that. So it, it's a, it's a lot of um, trial and error, unfortunately, to find mm -hmm. the right medication that's going to work with their body. Um, we, were, we were also on Trileptol. <laughs> she's been on quite a few a long list of them yeah she was on trileptol that didn't do nothing for her so thankfully we finally found the right combination that's, that's good news yeah. i've heard some parents mention um things like cbd and that do you know if any of the parents have been successful with that you know i've heard some parents that have had real success um are we always told ourselves if this medication did not work, we were going to go that route. Um, yeah. we had already start researching and exploring and our neuro had told us she didn't think that it would help because based on what she knew, the type mm -hmm. of seizures that she has, CBD wasn't going to um, work. 
but we were going to, she's like, you can try it. You can decide what you want to do. So if we hadn't gotten things under control, that was definitely something we wanted to explore. It's actually quite complicated because I've seen various videos on that, um, that subject. Mm -hmm. And some, some have been successful in not trisomy related, just in other areas. Some have been successful with THC Mm -hmm. um, treatments, whereas others with CBD and they're very different things, but people, people, some people don't understand that there's different things and they go for one thing and think, oh, it hasn't worked. You know, that's it. It doesn't work. But right. Right. It's quite complicated, isn't it? I think with all these medicines and things. and It is. And, you know, you have to look at the side effects. You have to look at yeah. how it's going to yeah. affect your child. <clears throat> you know, what works for one parent might not work for another parent because each of their bodies are so different. And again, it, I don't even like to use a lot of medications. I prefer to not take hardly anything, but at the same time, it's like Chris and I have talked about it. It's like, well, what would we rather deal with, you know, her having seizures and potentially having some type of life threatening episode or having them under control. It's like, well, <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. we're, we're going to get them under control because, you know, we can, we can deal with some of the other stuff that may, may be caused by the side effects. So. Yeah, it's a case of just always balancing up what's best, isn't it? And, yep, absolutely. I mean, well, I totally think from talking about all this, I think the the there's a clear difference, I think, between if, if a parent's watching this and having similar things happening, there seems to be quite a difference between breath hold spells, apneas, yep. and, and seizures. Um, and I think one that between us that's notable is the color changes, the mm -hmm. difference in the color changes. And um, I think that it, I think that's obviously a very important thing for anyone to watch out for because with Darcy with her breath hold, she clearly drains a color, goes right. completely drains a color, looks looks dead sometimes. Just you know, it's really really horrific it's horrible to see but they are <clears throat> in most cases relatively harmless compared to a seizure which right. can be very dangerous can't it um, yeah absolutely and the i think thing to watch out with seizures is you know are their heart rates really elevated or are they you know is it going lower you know how's their oxygen saturation if you're able to get that information. It's really important because then you'll know the level of danger with that seizure. And if you're exploring and wondering if it is, try to get it on video. That's the best thing that we try and do is take pictures and video a lot of things that happen. And, you know, we send that over to our doctors so that they can, you know, take a look and give us some recommendations. I think with breath holds, it's definitely so. In any scenario, I think the best advice is to try and video it, monitor the time. Yep. And definitely, I mean, do you? Would you? Um, you know, keep a su keep suction nearby for seizures and check airways. Oh yeah, suction <laughs> airways, turn up <laughs> oxygen for her, and I also kept a log. That was really important. Yeah, I, yeah. I keep a log of certain things that I know we have issues with um, in my phone, dates, times, how long it is, um, you know, if there's any illness or not. And then that way I can look at patterns. So that, that's been helpful as well as trying to look at patterns when things occur. Yeah. I think obviously um, <clears throat> anything that involves stopping breathing or seizures is very it's very important to get a medical professional involved as quick as possible yep. um but look out for these sort of things that we've spoke about and uh maybe try and help help the situation and help diagnose the situation with things like color changes videos notes and things that are happening to try and better 
diagnose what's going on, I think. That's probably the best advice I could give from what we've spoken about. Yeah. Um, but, right. um, and staying calm. Yep. Very okay. hard. Very hard. <laughs> very, very hard. But, you know, yeah, if it's definitely first go around, of course, get that emergency help, whatever you need. You know, don't discount that. You know, obviously we had already gone through several things or the times when Grace had it, she was under medical care. We were already in the hospital. So, yeah, you know. And we, you and I are talking from a, from a point of view of we've gone through it a lot of times, like possibly hundreds, I don't know. But <clears throat> I think what, what I'm trying to help sort of, with this information is people who are just first experiencing it and what to mm -hmm. do. And I think yep. it's very, you know, like I say, it's very important to stay calm and get a, get a medical professional involved as quick as possible, but also to take note of these other things and try and help diagnose the situation because often it gets slowed down because the doctors don't see it happening or don't see what's happening. Exactly. And when they, ask, when they ask this or that, sometimes you're so scared in the moment and that you don't actually take note of these things and you try and think back and you're like oh I don't know actually <laughs> exactly <laughs> and it slows down the diagnosis you've got to wait for it to happen again then haven't you and yep that's right it's um it's very important to sort of get these things sussed out and get these children the right treatment and I hope I, I need to draw this video to a close because we're hitting the hour mark nearly um but I hope anything that we've spoken about today will help anyone out there. And, you know, if you need further, if anyone's watching, they've got this far, well done. But um, <laughs> if you need further help or anything, just check out the links below and you can come and talk to us or any other parents that are in the groups or the um, charity workers at places like Soft. And uh, yeah even if you just need to chat because these are traumatic things that happen and sometimes it can just feel like you're losing the plot and you know the whole world's against you and uh, it's like hey just come and talk we're all there there's lots of us about and we have these groups that are brilliant help for most parents um but yeah that's that's i'm i'm happy leaving it there that's all i really wanted to say at the end there yeah, good chat, good conversation. Yeah, I th think next week though, I'm I'm going to try and hopefully we can zoom because <clears throat> I would like to try and get um, some of the other parents to come and say hi as well. Um, I know there's a few. There's uh, Aya in Japan that I've told you about. It'd be nice to hear about how things are done there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know Teresa's keen to come and say hi, the one that runs the Tries Me group for the American, it seems to be heavily American uh, dominated, doesn't it, the group? It's very, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, and she does a brilliant job running that and getting information in there and pinning posts with helpful information for people. So uh, she wants to come and say hi. I know you've got a few as well that want to say yep, hi. I've definitely you? got a few people in mind. Yep. Yeah. So I think I'll definitely definitely next week like to try and get someone else to come talk to us and share their experiences um so yeah if, if that if you're happy with that we will we will go forward with that next week special guest yet to be confirmed <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah um i'm happy to leave this here and uh yeah i'll see if, let's see if we can stop this within a minute we've got 50 seconds to go so anything you want to say Oh, I'm good. Now this is this is wonderful. So okay, all right then. Um, well, I'll stop this here. So until our next video. Bye. Take care and look after yourselves out there.